there was a wood lake, Hourglass Lake, not as I had thought it was spelled, a few miles from Ramsdale. And there was one week of great heat at the end of July when we drove there daily. I am now obliged to describe in some tedious detail our last swim there together one tropical Tuesday morning. We had left the car in a parking area not far from the road and were making our way down a path cut through the pine forest to the lake when Charlotte remarked that Jean, uh, Jean Farlow, in quest of rare light effects, Jean belonged to the old school of painting, had seen Leslie taking a dip in the ebony, as John had quipped, at five o'clock in the morning last Sunday. The water, I said, must have been quite cold. That is not the point, said the logical doomed deer. He's subnormal, you see, and, she continued, in that carefully phrased way of hers that was beginning to tell on my health, I have a very definite feeling our Louis is in love with that moron. Feeling. We feel Dolly is not doing us well, etc., from an old school report. report. The Humberts walked on, sandaled and robbed. Do you know, Ham, I have one most ambitious dream, pronounced Lady Ham, lowering her head, shy of that dream, and communing with the tawny ground. I would love to get hold of a real trained servant maid, like that German girl that Talbot spoke of, and have her leave in the house. No room, I said. Come, she said with her quizzical smile. Surely, chérie, you underestimate the possibilities of the Humbert home. We would put her in Lowe's room. I intended to make a guest room of that hole anyway. It's the coolest, it's the coldest, and meanest in the whole house. What are you talking about? I asked, the skin of my cheekbones tensing up. This I take the trouble to note only because my daughter's skin did the same when she felt that way, disbelief, disgust, irritation. Are you bothered by romantic associations? queried my wife in allusion to her first surrender. Hell no, said I. I just wonder where will you put your daughter when you get your guest in, on your maid? When you get your guest or your maid? Ah! said Mrs. Humbert, dreaming, smiling, drawing out the ha ah! simultaneously with the raise of one eyebrow and a soft exhalation of breath. Little Low, I'm afraid, does not enter the picture at all, at all. Little Low goes straight from camp to a good boarding school with a strict discipline and some sound religious training. And then, Bertsley College, I have it all mapped out, you need not worry. She went on to say that she, Mrs. Humbert, would have to overcome her habitual sloth and write to Miss Phelan's sister who taught at St. Algebra. The dazzling lake emerged. I said I had forgotten my sunglasses in the car and would catch up with her. I had always thought that wringing one's hands was a fictional gesture, the obscure outcome perhaps of some medieval ritual, but, but as I took to the woods for a spell of despair and desperate meditation, this was the gesture. Look, Lord, at these chains. That would have come nearest to the mute expression of my mood. Had Charlotte been Valeria, I would have known how to handle the situation, and handle is the word I want, in the good old ways, by merely twisting fat Valieczka, Valieczka's brittle wrist, the one she had fallen upon from a bicycle, I could make her change her mind instantly. But anything of the sort in regard to Charlotte was unthinkable. Blunt American Charlotte frightened me. My light-hearted dream of controlling her through her passion for me was all wrong. I dared not do anything to spoil the image of me she had set up to adore. I had towed it to her I had told died to her when she was the awesome duenna of my darling, and a groveling something still persisted in my attitude toward her. The only ace I held was her ignorance of my monstrous love for her low. 
She had been annoyed by Lowe's liking me, but my feelings she could not divine. To Valeria, I might have said, Look, here, you fat fool, c'est moi qui décide what is good for Dolores Hambert. To Charlotte, I could not even say with ingratiating calm, Excuse me, my dear, I disagree. Let us give the child one more chance. Let me be her private tutor for a year or so. You once told me yourself. In fact, I could not say anything at all to Charlotte about the child without giving myself away. Oh, you cannot imagine, as I had never imagined, what these women of principle are. Charlotte, who did not notice the falsity of all the everyday conventions and rules of behaviors and foods and books and people she dotted upon, would distinguish at once a false intonation in anything I might say with a view to keeping low near. She was like a musician who may be an odious Bulgarian in ordinary life, devoid of tact and taste, but who will hear a false note in music with diabolical diabolical accuracy of judgment. To break Charlotte's will, I would have to break her heart. If I broke her heart, her image of me would break too. If I said, either I have my way with Lolita and you help me to keep the matter quiet, or we part at once. She would have turned as pale as a woman of clouded glass and slowly replied, All right, whatever you add or retract, this is the end. And the end it would be. Such then was the mess. I remember reaching the parking area and pumping a handful of rust-tasting water and drinking, drinking it as avidly as if it could give me magic wisdom youth, freedom, a tiny concubine. For a while, purple-robed, heel dangling, I sat on the edge of one of the rude tables under the whooshing pines. In the middle distance, two little maidens in shorts and halters came out of a sun-dappled, privy-marked women. Gamchiu and Mabel, or Mabel's understudy, laboriously absent-mindedly straddled a bicycle and Marion, shaking her hair because of the flies, settled behind, legs wide apart, and wobbling, they slowly, absently merged with the light and shade. Lolita, father and daughter, melting into these woods. The natural solution was to destroy Mrs. Humbert. But how? No man can bring about the perfect murder. Chance, however, can do it. There was the famous dispatch of uh, Madame Lacour in Arles, southern France, at the close of last century. An, an identified bearded six-footer who, it was later conjectured, had been the lady's secret, secret lover, walked up to her in a crowded street soon after her marriage to Colonel Lacour, and mortally stabbed her in the back three times while the colonel, a small bulldog of a man, hung on to the murderous arm. By a miraculous, miraculous and beautiful coincidence, right at the moment when the operator was in the act of loosening the angry little husband's jaws, while several, while several onlookers were closing in up the group, in upon the group, a cranky Italian in the house nearest to the scene set off by sheer accident some kind of explosive he was tinkering with, and immediately the street was turned into a pandemonium of smoke, falling bricks and running people. The explosion hurt no one, except that it knocked out Game Colonel Lacour. But the lady's ven vengeful lover ran when the others ran, and lived happily ever after. Now look what happens when the operator himself plans a perfect removal. I walked down to our glass lake, the spot from which we had an, from the spot from which we and a few other nice couples, the Farlows, the Chatfields, bathed was a kind of a small cove. My Charlotte liked it because it was almost a private beach. 
the main bathing facilities or drowning facilities as the Ramsdale Journal had had occasion to say were in the left eastern part of the hourglass and could not be seen from our covlet. To our right the pines soon gave way to a curve or marshland with which turned again into forest on the opposite side. I sat down beside my wife so noiselessly that she started. Shall we go in? she asked. We shall in a minute. Let me follow a train of thought. I thought. More than a minute passed. All right, come on. Was he... <laughs> okay. All right, come on. Was it on... Was I on that train? You certainly were. I hope so, said Charlotte, entering the water. It soon reached the goose flesh of her thick thighs, and then joining her outstretched hands, shutting her mouth, her mouth tight, very plain faced in her black rubber headgear, headgear, Charlotte flung herself forward with a great splash. Slowly we swam out into the shimmer of the lake. On the opposite bank, at least a thousand paces away, if one could walk across water, I could make out the tiny figures of two men working like beavers on their stretch of shore. I knew exactly who they were, a retired policeman of Polish descent and the retired plumber who owned most of the timber on that side of the lake. And I also knew they were engaged in building, just for the dismal fun of the thing, a wharf. The knocks that reached us uh, seemed so much bigger than what could be distinguished of those dwarf, dwarfs' arms and tools. Indeed, one suspected the director of those acrosonic effects to have been at odds with the puppet master, especially since the hefty crack of each diminutive blow lagged behind its visual version. The short white sand strip of our beach, from which by now we had gone a little way to reach deep water, um, was empty on week weekday mornings. There was nobody around except those two tiny, very busy figures on the opposite side and a dark red private plane that droned overhead and then disappeared in the blue. The setting was really perfect for a brisk bubbling murder. And here was the subtle point. The man of law and the man of water were just near enough to witness an accident and just far enough not to observe a crime. They were near enough to hear a distracted bother thrashing about, thrashing about and bellowing for somebody to come and help him save his drowning wife. And they were too far to distinguish if they happened to look too soon that the anything but distracted swimmer was finishing to trade his wife underfoot. I was not yet at that stage, I merely want to convey the ease of the act, the nicety of the setting. So there was Charlotte swimming on with a dutiful awkwardness, she was a very medical mermaid, but not without a certain solemn pleasure, for was not the merman by her side, and as I watched with the stark lucidity of a future recollection, you know, trying to see things as you will remember having seen them, the glossy whiteness of her wet face, so little tanned despite all her endeavors, 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 and her pale lips, and her naked convex forehead, and the tight black cap, and the plump wet neck, I knew that all I had to do was to drop back, take a deep breath, then grab her by the ankle and rapidly dive with my captive corpse. I say corpse because surprise, panic and inexperience would cause her to inhale at once a lethal, lethal gallon of lake, while I would be able to hold on for at least a full minute, open-eyed open -eyed underwater. The fatal gesture passed like the tail of a falling star across the blackness of the contemplated crime. It was like some dreadful silent ballet, ballet 
the male dancer holding the ballerina by her foot and streaking down through watery twilight. I might come up for a mouthful of air while still holding her down, and then would dive again as many times as would be necessary. And only when the curtain came down on her for good would I permit myself to yell for help. And when some twenty minutes later the two puppets steadily growing arrived in a rowboat, one half newly painted, poor Mrs. Humbert Humbert, the victim of a cramp of coronary occlusion, or both, would be standing on her head in the inky ooze, some thirty feet below the smiling surface of our glass lake. Simple, was it not? But what do you know, folks? I just could not make myself do it. She swam beside me, a trustful and clumsy seal, and all the logic of passion screamed in my ear. Now is the time, and folks, I just couldn't. In silence, I turned shoreward and gravely, dutifully, she also turned, and still hell screamed its counsel, and still I could not make myself drown the poor, slippery, big-bodied creature. The scream grew more and more remote, as I realized the melancholy fact that neither tomorrow nor Friday nor any other day or night could I make myself put her to death. Oh, I could visualize myself slapping Valeria's breasts out of alignment or otherwise hurting her, and I could see myself no less clearly shooting her lover in the underbelly and making him say, ah, and sit down, but I could not kill Charlotte especially when things were on the whole not quite as hopeless perhaps as they seemed at first winds at first winds on that miserable morning were i to catch her by her strong kicking foot were i to see her amazed look hear her awful voice were i still to go through with the ordeal her ghost would haunt me all my life Perhaps in the year where 1447 instead of 1947, if the year were 1447 instead of 1947, I might have hoodwinked my gentle nature by administering her some classical poison from a hollow agate, some tender filter of dead. But in our middle class nosy era, it would not have come off the way it used to in the broke palaces of the past. Nowadays you have to be a scientist if you want to be a killer. No, no, I, I was neither. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the majority of the sex offenders that hanker for some throbbing, sweet moaning, physical but not necessarily coital relation with a girl child are innocuous, inadequate, passive, timid strangers who merely ask the community to allow them to pursue their practically harmless, so-called aberrant behavior, their little hot, wet private acts of sexual deviation, without the police and society cracking down upon them. We are not sex fiends. We do not rape as good soldiers do. We are unhappy, mild, dog-eyed gentlemen, sufficiently well integrated to control our urge in the presence of adults, but ready to give years and years of life for one chance to touch an infant. Emphatically, no killers are we. Poets never kill. Oh, my poor Charlotte, do not hate me. In your eternal heaven, among an eternal alchemy of asphalt and rubber and metal and stone. But thank God, not water. Not water. Nonetheless, it was a very close shave, speaking quite objectively, and now comes the point of my perfect crime parable. We sat down on our towels in the thirsty sun. She looked around, loosened her bra, and turned over on her stomach to give her back a chance to be feasted upon. She said she loved me. She sighed deeply. She extended one arm and groped in the pocket of her robe for her cigarettes. She sat up and smoked. She examined her right shoulder. She kissed me heavily with open smoky mouth. Suddenly, down the sand, 
behind us. From under the bushes and pines, a stone rolled, then another. Those disgusting prying kids, said Charlotte, holding up her big bra to her breast and turning prone again. I shall have to speak about that to Peter Krestovsky from the bush from the debouchment of the trail came a rustle, a football, and Jim Farlow marched down with her easel and things. You scared us, said Charlotte. Jean said she had been up there, in a place of green concealment, spying on nature, spies are generally shot, trying to finish a lakescape. But it was no good. She had no talent whatever, which was quite true. And have you ever tried painting, Humbert? Charlotte, who was a little jealous of Jean, wanted to know if John was coming. He was. He was coming home for lunch today. He had dropped her on the way to Parkington and should be picking her up any time now. It was a grand morning. She always felt a traitor to Caval and Melampus for leaving them roped on such gorgeous days. She sat down on the white sand between Charlotte and me. She wore shorts. Her long brown legs were about as attractive to me as those of a chestnut mare. She showed her gums when she smiled. I almost put both of you into my leg, she said. I even noticed something you overlooked. You, addressing Humbert, had your wristwatch on it. Yes, sir, you had. Waterproof, said Charlotte softly, making a fish mouth. Jean took my wrist upon her knee and examined Charlotte's gift, then put back Humbert's hand on the sand, palm up. You could see anything that way, remarked Charlotte coquettishly. Jean sighed. I once saw, she said, two children, male and female, at sunset right here, making love. Their shadows were giants, and I told you about Mrs. Mr. Thompson at daybreak. Next time I expect to see fat old Ivor in the ivory. He's really a freak, that man. Last time he told me a completely indecent story about his nephew, it appears. Hello there, said John's voice 